Hi, everyone, and welcome to Insights for L&D Professionals podcast. My name is Katrina, and I'm your host today. I work as a product uh, analyst and product uh, manager here at Stillsoft and uh, working on an LMS app for counselors. I get to talk to many people who organize employee training, and they have so many questions. So this podcast is our way of bringing some insightful information from the experts of the field. And that's our first podcast. And we have a great guest today, Guy Wallace. And Guy is a performance analyst and instructional architect. In 2010, Guy received the Honor Life Member Award from International Society for Performance Improvement. And as an instructional design consultant, Guy has worked with over 80 clients since 1982, so 40 years of experience. Really impressive. Guy and his teams have won awards for, for their work at AT&T, Change Healthcare, General Motors, HP, Imperial Oil, and Siemens Building Technologies. He is the author of 18 books and over 100 published articles. So I could go on and on. Uh, Guy, welcome, and I'm so honored to have you here today. Well, thank you for inviting me. Great, and uh, to start off, uh, could you say what's human performance technology and why task and output orientation is more efficient than topic-based approach? Yeah, so let me take the first part, human performance technology. I need to explain a little bit about some of the wording in that a phrase. Technology stands for the application of science. It's not about digital or computer technology, but that's that's the usage of the word going decades back. Um, so, and human performance relates to all sorts of performance because performance is a human endeavor. Uh, if we need to use a bulldozer to clear a lot so we can put up a building, that's human performance. Um, and so it, it's not intended to be limited to the human in the performance. It's to look at from like a systems engineering approach, a systems thinking approach. What are all the variables about performance and how do we improve ultimate performance? And that's a, maybe a nice segue into the question about looking uh, at instruction or training and learning and looking at the outputs and tasks rather than just topics. This has been an issue since I've been in the business and I started back in 1979. A lot of instructional content is focused on topics. And what that's often missing is how to apply those topics in somebody's real world performance requirements. And so we may have formal training, instruction, formal learning on a topic, but then we force the learner, who is a performer, into informal learning to figure out how to apply it if it wasn't addressed adequately in, what, in the learning experience. And this is unfortunate. It forces people to, into informal social learning where they might ask somebody for help in how to apply it, or they might do trial and error learning, trying it, and if it doesn't work quite right, they try it again and again and again. It's it ultimately, it can be effective, but it certainly isn't efficient. So the, what I learned on day one out of college in my job as an instructional developer back in 1979 was to focus on the performance. And, and by that, it meant looking at the outputs of performance first, understanding that people perform tasks, they employ behaviors, uh, they use their knowledge of topics, and facts to produce an output, which becomes a worthy input downstream to an internal customer, to an external customer. But so if our focus is on that output, which becomes an input, we can then better decide what are the tasks. There's, and there's two types, behavioral tasks that we can see, we can observe. And there's cognitive tasks, the thinking tasks that parallel the doing tasks. We need to understand what those tasks are that are required to produce a worthy output, an output that meets the stakeholder requirements, the tasks and the task performance that meets the stakeholder requirements. 
Um, and so human performance technology looks at all of that, plus all of the non-human enablers, such as what are the materials, the data, the tools, the performance context, the facilities that people are working in. It looks at everything that affects that ability to perform tasks, to produce outputs to stakeholder requirements. Yeah, it makes so much sense to me. But while I was researching for this podcast, uh, I figured out that this approach is not widely adopted for some reason. Uh, what's your explanation? Why? <laughs> well, this is an age old mystery, as we <laughs> might joke. Um, and the thought leaders in the profession, when I first joined in 1979, they lamented that state, the fact that it is not fully embraced. And there's too much focus, as I said, on the topics or on the behaviors without understanding what are people trying to produce. Um, I, I think a lot of it goes back to there's poor practices, poor processes in learning and development organizations. And that's not the fault of the learning and development practitioner. It's really the fault of their leadership. Why hasn't their leadership put in processes and practices that are performance oriented? And sometimes it's because they don't know any better. And sometimes they perceive it's just too difficult because it requires people to do analysis. And if you don't have good methodologies for doing analysis, analysis becomes analysis paralysis. And that's upsetting to customers. Uh, our, our customers, our clients have seen perhaps too many instances of analysis being conducted where it didn't add any value, where you couldn't see where did that analysis data end up affecting, impacting the design and development of instruction. And, and when I use the word instruction, I mean both what was formerly called job aids and training and sometimes is called resources and courses and is becoming more popularly known as uh, performance support and learning experiences. Those are all the same thing. It's just changes in the language over the decades. But so instruction is all of that and to do a good job of providing people instruction, guidance in the workflow, or a learning experience so they have things memorized or have a skill that's well honed, um, that requires doing the analysis of what's the performance requirements, what's the performance context, and making sure that your instruction fits that and gives people the information they need, the demonstrations they need, and the application exercises, the practice with feedback, so that when they go back to the job, they have the competence, the initial competence, and enough confidence to try to do things differently as they were taught. Oh, I see. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. So I bet over the years you had quite a few situations uh, where um, you met clients uh, who were so focused on this uh, topic-based approach and uh, it was your job to uh, somehow make them believe or try uh, the other way, like performance-based approach. Can you think of one of the challenges uh, like that and how did it work out? Well, I, that is very typical. There's two major issues. People come and ask you to deliver or to develop content on a topic. And sometimes they want that topic to be applicable for everyone. And that's very difficult. That's a one size fits all issue. But, but when, my, when my prospects, the requesters have come to me and asked me to develop instruction or training or learning on a topic, I do my best to clarify their request. I learned a long time ago not to challenge their request because I'm, I'm supposed to be a team player. I'm in a support function. I'm here to help them. And the last thing they want to hear from me is me challenging them as to whether or not instruction or learning is required. So I try to do my best active listening to make sure that they know that I heard them and then I clarify their request. And at some point, I'll make a slight pivot to what would practice look like? 
what would people practice and what would they produce regarding this topic? And that begins the shift from topics to tasks and outputs. And I think that mo most of the time when clients come to us and ask us about a topic, they're thinking about uh, training and learning in an educational context, not in an enterprise learning context. They're used to being in, in school where topics were addressed and there wasn't a focus on what are the specific tasks and outputs of the target audience. Because in a school situation, we the, the, the teachers, the professors, they don't necessarily know. In an enterprise, we can generally know what is the application of this topic, this knowledge to the workflow. And the only issue that we can run into is when they want to have some instruction, some learning on a topic and have it applicable to everybody, which is, which might be the case if it's logging onto the company's computer system, then everybody needs to know how to do that. But there's, so there's some of that, but very few topics are generally applicable across the board. So we're asked to do generic training content and, and, and then we hope that the learners will figure out how to apply it in their context. And that's where we run into this issue where formal training is forces the learner into informal training because informal training because the formal training wasn't adequate, wasn't complete, didn't address how to apply the topic. And so asking about practice shifts that conversation where the requester who may or may not know what the application is, they may be kind of a middleman uh, bringing somebody else's request to us. So we have to be careful about how we challenge them. We want to clarify that. We may need to seek uh, our ability to talk to other individuals about this so that we are clear as to what would the practice look like. And most of the time that makes sense to the requester, to our clients that, oh, sure, people would have to practice. Otherwise, we can't just tell them and hope that they'll remember that and take it back to the job. So that forces some thinking there about what is that application? What would authentic practice with feedback look like so that we can truly prepare people to be ready to go back to the job and perform? Oh, it sounds like a lot of wisdom uh, from, from you here where you take time and patience to guide your clients uh, to make that shift. It's, it's really impressive. Yeah, nice. And uh, if we talk more about this evidence-based approach uh, to improving performance, uh, how does the process look like and uh, what are their major steps? Well, I have a framework that I use for my instructional development projects, whether uh, you call that instruction or training or learning, and it's an addy like model. And I adapted this back in 1982 when I left Motorola and became a consultant. And I had to sell projects and I had to price projects and I had to establish schedules for projects because clients always want to know when will it be done and how much is it going to cost me? So the addy like framework is a project management framework and not a design method. So that's often confused by people coming into the field. They think that ADDIE is a design methodology and is not. It's simply a project planning uh, framework. But my first phase in my efforts is called project planning and kickoff. And that's where I do the intake process of the request. I develop a draft project plan. I then review that project plan with the client and a committee, a team that I call a project steering team of the key stakeholders and I need them to sign off on the project um, because it's they're a stakeholder. And so this should be worth it to them. And I'm going to need their people and other resources. And rather than me begging the organization to give them to me in a timely manner, I need the group of stakeholders to make that happen. So I tell the stakeholders that I'm giving them a command and control mechanism to control the project but that I get empowerment out of that. They are empowering me to go do the project on their behalf and to make it happen quickly and effectively and efficiently. 
So that's project planning and kickoff. And I, one of the things I always do with my project steering teams is I tell them at the beginning of every meeting that they have four options at the end of the meeting. Number one, kill the project because it doesn't make any business sense. My clients hate when I lead with that. They, they would rather that I mention that last. But I always like to lead with that because I want them to know that if this does not make business sense, kill it. Uh, their second option is to uh, modify our approach going forward because we've learned something, they have different insights, and they can see that we need to do this a little bit differently than the current plan. So we might modify the plan. The third option is to defer the project until something else happens. And it may be there's a process re-engineering uh, thing going on, and we should wait until that's done, and then we should tackle the learning the instruction that would relate to that process. And the fourth option is to approve the project plan as it is and resource it with the right people and the right things and help us make it happen on their behalf. Um, and if we pass that gate, I call these meetings gate review meetings because they get to lift the gate and we can proceed or they keep the gate closed and slow the project down, put it on hold, or they kill it off. If, if we're successful at that first phase, then we go into phase two, which is analysis. And then that leads to phase three, which is design. And there are two gate meetings in each of those phases. So we check in with the client, with the project steering team. They get to review the data that we have, the analysis data or the design, and they get to modify it or approve it or kill the project off, whatever they think is best, because we're doing this for them. And if we have passed the design phase gate at the end of that phase, then we go into development and we create versions of the content. I call them the alpha version and the beta version. And I test the versions with target audience members, with master performers, with subject matter experts and get their approval of it to get ready to go do a pilot test. Now, traditionally, people would think of pilot testing the materials inside the development phase, but I've extracted that so that I can make an emphasis of that, make a big deal out of that with the project steering team. And I would tell them, we're gonna do these, this development of the content, we're gonna get ready for a pilot test, and then we're gonna do a full destructive test of our learning content. And if there's problems with it, if it's not accurate, complete, or appropriate, we hope to find that and fix it before we make it generally available to everybody through push or pull mechanisms. So the pilot testing is really critical. I asked my project steering team for two types of people in the pilot test, the target audience members, so that we can measure whether learning occurs or not. We can do pre and post testing to see did learning occur? Did people gain the knowledge? Did they gain the skills that we intended by design or not? And then the other group that's in the pilot test are master performers and other subject matter experts who can help us with, is the content accurate? Is it complete? Is it appropriate? The target audience won't be able to tell us any of that because they wouldn't know. The We can't measure learning with master performers and other subject matter experts because theoretically, they already know. So I need the two sets of people so that I can get different information from them to decide, is our instruction, is our learning effective? Are people learning? And was it the right content in the first place for them? And then any issues that I have can be resolved and fixed before we are done with the project and then hand off the content to the LMS or LXP or whatever systems we have in place to deploy the content or to make it accessible by the target audience. Wow, it sounds like a really complex process, yeah. Well, I, I've had people say to me before at conferences that Guy makes this sound very complex, but actually it's not. So I would like to think that it's not, but it is as rigorous as required and as flexible as feasible, but there's a logical set of steps to go through to produce content. Now, if I'm trying to produce something that's a, a 30 minute set of content, I can do all of these things together, but normally as a consultant, I've been brought in to do 
really high stakes performance where there's high risks and high rewards. And usually the content is not some 15 minute or 30 minute uh, chunk of content. I'm asked to come in and develop a series of modules. Maybe it's delivered all at once. Maybe it's delivered over a, a two or three or four week period or months. But I'm asked to tackle big projects and where the stakes are very high as to whether you get it right or not. And therefore, the rigor in my process helps me address those kinds of things where this has significant consequences to the organization. That's why I can ask for stakeholders on a project steering team, because they're all concerned that we, we do well. They don't want us to do poorly and fail because they live with the consequences of that. So I can usually engage them and, and entice them to participating in the project, to oversee the project, and to give me the resources that I need. Many of us struggle in the learning and development profession when we're trying to get the right people to participate with us in a timely fashion, or to have people do the reviews of our drafts of content in a timely fashion. If I'm working for a project steering team of high level uh, managers, and they're the ones who are helping me to make this happen, I'm going to be much more successful in meeting my deadlines to getting the participation of the right people. Um, it, it, the, the challenge is, can I get the top master performers and, and learn enough from them that I can construct instruction that will impact others and get everybody else to perform at higher levels, closer to what the master performers are doing. And master performers are generally very busy. They don't have time to fool around and to play around with the learning and development folks. They're busy doing their jobs. And the only way to get them to participate adequately with their full attention is to get their boss or their boss's boss or their boss's boss's boss to tell them, this is part of their job in the short run. And they are to participate with us and help us build content that's gonna have a positive impact to the rest of the people doing that job. Yeah. And uh, from what I read uh, in your articles, uh, it seems to me that the analysis step is extremely important. Could you speak a bit more about that and maybe cover some common mistakes people make at this stage? Yes. So uh, one of the books that I wrote back in 2020 was about conducting performance-based instructional analysis in each and every phase of the project. So I do analysis in project planning and kickoff, and I do analysis in the analysis phase. And I continue to do analysis in the design phase, in the development phase, in the pilot testing phase, and my final phase, which is revision and release. So what, what I'm trying to avoid is analysis paralysis, where I try to do all of it to great depths of detail at one point in the project. And that leads to analysis paralysis. And the other issue I think is that people don't know what analysis data to get. So they try to get everything just in case they need it because they're not sure. And one of the things I learned from the total quality management movement back in 1981 was this phrase that says, we don't boil the ocean for a cup of tea. And that rang true with me because I had seen other people struggle with doing analysis for instruction or training or learning, and they weren't sure what data to get. So when I became a consultant, I, I was given the lead of the uh, training practice of our consulting firm. So it was mine. I got to define how we would do business, how we would plan projects, how we would conduct projects. And so I standardized on four types of analysis. The first type is target audience analysis. The second type is ideal performance and current state gaps. The third is enabling knowledge and skills. And the fourth is assessment of existing content for its reuse potential. That's a mouthful, but I don't believe in reinventing the wheels when we already own wheels. We should just use them. And, and if we need to modify them, then we should do that. But let me go back to the first thing. In the target audience, I want to know 
who are we targeting? Who are the primary target audiences? Who might be the secondary target audiences and who might be the tertiary target audiences? Primary means we're trying to affect their performance in total. Secondary means that maybe we're gonna produce something for the primary audience that the secondary target audience might be able to use, but they're not our primary target audience. So if they have other needs, we're not, we're not interested in addressing them. We're really interested in the primary target audience. And I came up with a tertiary target audience because I went through an entire project, months and months that the client spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on. And at the end of the project, one of the project steering team members said, well, I don't see how we're addressing this other target audience. And I thought they had been in all these meetings and it had never occurred to them that we would never mentioned that other target audience, but they were very disappointed. And so I learned a lesson from that and I learned to identify who is in this tertiary target audience, the third target audience. And my definition of that is that we don't care what they need. They're not on our radar screen. The, you know, you might think that, yeah, we're going to include them, but no, we're going to list them as not included, not included, not included, not included, just to be clear as to who's inside the box, who sits on the edges of the box, and who's outside the box. That's how we're going to uh, deal with who it is we're addressing because we're trying to impact performance and we can't have people mistakenly think that we're going to be addressing some other target audiences. So the target audience, that, so you first clarify those things and then you, under, then you want to understand what are their job titles and does everybody do the same thing as everybody else? Or are there some people who only do part of the job and other people who do another part of the job and is it all mixed up? Or is everybody doing the exact same thing? So there's variance in job assignments within job titles. Job titles are from the convenience of human resources and the set compensation systems. They do not define what people do on the job. They're just a convenient category. So I've learned because I've been burned, uh, what, what are the various parts of the job and how is that? How does that vary from person to person with that same job title? So I want to understand that, clarify that, confirm that with my project steering team so that they know that, okay, I see how this works in the real world. And then the second part of target audience analysis is wanting to understand what are the typical incoming knowledge and skills from prior education and prior experience? What might they already know? And is that very because if I'm hiring degreed engineers and then people off the street, if if I if the job requires them to know AC DC electrical theory, well, the degreed engineers are going to know that, but the people off the street may not. So I don't need to train the degreed engineers on AC DC electrical theory, so I can modularize that content, separate it, so people can skip what they don't need because it's not part of their job or they already know it. And they can get what they need because that's part of their job assignment and they didn't know it. So it's that mixture of what can we safely assume about the target audience? And, and so we, that will impact our design, our configuration of the content, the modularization of the content so that we make it more uh, personalized as well as performance-ized. So I want the content to reflect the performance requirements, but I need to personalize it to that individual and what's expected of them on the job and what do they already know. So, and that's a lot just to, to clarify that because sometimes that's quickly understood and communicated to me, but more often than not, my clients aren't really sure. And then we have to go digging to make sure that we understand this target audience because sometimes the, the boss's boss and the boss's boss's boss, they don't know. But it makes sense to them when I start asking them these questions here, and then they can point me to the people who will have the answers and help me get those answers from people. So the second type of uh, analysis is the ideal performance and the gaps. And so I use master performers and identify what are the outputs they produced, what are the key measures, what are the tasks performed, what are the various roles and responsibilities, and identify that. 
And if that constitutes the mastery performance, that's what people do, that's what they produce, this is the measures that are applied to that, then I use the master performers to help me understand what do non-master performers struggle with? And I go back to the output and the measures and measure by measure, I ask them, is this a problem for the non-master performers? Yes or no? And if it is, we document that. And then we ask these master performers, why do you think that is? Why are people struggling with the, the, the schedule? They're good at the quality. They're good at the quantity, the schedule. They miss the schedule measure every time or most of the time. And they can tell me why. Now, master performers are usually close enough to the performance of others that they know why other people are struggling. However, as I tell my clients, just because they all concede to that doesn't make them right. But it's a start for us to say, we think that this is the cause of the problem of the gap. And then we can look at that probable cause and determine whether that's a that that's caused by a deficit of knowledge and skills of the non-master performers, or is it some lack of environmental supports, or is it some other human attributes such as they're too shy and, and they're not bold enough to go get the information? Now, what is the issues here? Will, will instruction, will learning address that adequately? And yes or no is the answer to that. So that clarification of here's the performance, here's the current state gaps, and the current state gaps also tell you when you develop learning, that's hard to learn. So we're going to have to give that extra attention. Some things in performance are easy to learn and other things are more difficult to learn. And so this gives me the data that I need to go and affect the design appropriately. The third piece of, of the analysis is understanding what are the enabling knowledge and skills. So if I understand performance, what people have to do, I need to know what they need to know in order to be able to do that. And so I have 17 categories of enabling knowledge and skills that I use to systematically derive those enabling knowledge and skills and that becomes basically a bill of materials for the eventual instruction. So I understand all the piece parts. There's, there's laws, regulations, and codes. There's company policies and procedures. There's internal organizations you may need to know about. There's external organizations. There's computer to hardware and software. There's interpersonal skills. There's marketplace knowledge. There, there's our own product and service knowledge. And not every one of these knowledge and skill categories is appropriate for every job, but I have a mastery list of this that I've been using since the early 80s. It started off as eight knowledge and skill categories, and it's been 17 now for 30-some years. The fourth type of analysis that I alluded to a little bit earlier was that I want to understand, now that I understand the performance and the knowledge and skills, I can begin to look at the my client's current inventory of content, training, instruction, learning, and see, do they have anything that I can use as is or after modification? Or is what I'm looking for a gap? And therefore we're gonna have to build or buy content to put it in place. But there may be other content that was developed for other audiences and maybe I can use it as is, or maybe I can just tweak it, uh, modify it, and then use it, and that will save me time and uh, money if I can do that. So now, when I do this analysis, I know what I just described. It sounds like it takes forever, analysis paralysis, but I can typically do the analysis on an entire job in a three-day meeting and with some data gathering before and after that meeting. So within a week, I can take an entire job like a sales job or a, a dealer auditor job or a financial analyst job and have all of that captured and ready for review with my project steering team in five days or less. Wow. It sounds like detective work in a good way, in an exciting way. Yeah. It's, it's really amazing. And I read in one of your articles about um, subject matter experts and how it's not always the best approach just to just talk to them and try and figure out why they are successful. Uh, yeah, could you say a few words about that? Because I think it's important. Yes, so I 
a backstory back in 1981 at Motorola, I did some work with the corporate subject matter expert in purchasing. And the person hadn't been out in the field doing purchasing work for seven years. And I relied on them for my content and we built uh, some training and we went and pilot tested it and it was a, it was a disaster. And when I reviewed the results of the pilot test with my project steering team, I tried to take all the blame and they said, no, it's not you. You didn't have the right person, people. It wasn't detailed enough according to the feedback. And so I said, well, what I need is I need to work with your master performers. And at first I used the word exemplar, which comes from Tom Gilbert's work and his book from 1978, Human Competence. I asked for their exemplars and my clients hated that word. And so I said, well, how about master performers? And they said, yes, that will work. But so I think there's subject matter experts that were given that aren't masters at the performance we're trying to affect. Now, if we're going after a topic, that might sound okay, but I'm always going after performance. Topics applied to performance, that's what I want. So I need to know and work with people who are doing the job at a level of mastery. And there may be other subject matter experts who know quality or the regulations or from the law department or some other aspect, but they don't do the job and they certainly don't do it at a level of mastery and understand the nuances of performance. So I separate those two. But one of the huge issues for dealing with master performers and subject matter experts is that uh, according to the research, and I've, I got this from Dr. Richard E. Clark, Professor Emeritus from uh, the University of Southern California, who's been studying this for 25 years or so, but most knowledge is non-conscious. I can do the work, but I can't explain it to you in great depth. In fact, if I'm talking to you about the decisions that I make while I'm doing my work, I will miss up to 70% of it. I can only tell you 30% of what I do when I'm making a decision. And if I'm talking to you about my procedural knowledge, I will miss up to 35% of that. The things that you and I could watch me doing, and I'll explain it to you, but I'll still miss 35% of it because I have automated that. And our issue is that when we work with one subject matter expert or one master performer and rely on everything that they give us, we're starting in a hole. We, they can't give us 100%. They can only give us either 30% or 65%. And therefore, our instruction, while it might be accurate, it will be incomplete. And so what Dr. Clark, what Dick Clark, uses is, a, is his version of cognitive task analysis. And there's many versions of this and many of them are inadequate according to his research on this. Um, and cognitive task analysis is looking to understand uh, what the thinking is along with the doing. And his model is that he meets with five different uh, master performers or experts and he elicits from them all the content that he needs to build instruction. And after working with five people, because they each know a different 30% and they each know a, uh, a different 65%. So when you work with them, you can fill in the gaps from each other and review each, the combination of everything and make it better and better. But what he's told me is that after five people, it's the law of diminishing returns. You don't get uh, as much from the next sixth and seventh person. So they generally stop at five. And that'll get you to about 85% of what a novice needs. So the whole issue is, if we're trying to take a novice and get them on the road to performance, climbing the learning curve, climbing the performance curve, if we rely on one source, we will have incomplete content. And that, again, forces the learner into informal means to learn trial and error or informal social learning. And when, we, when they do social learning and they ask somebody else, whoever they ask also knows only 30% of the decision-making information that they use and their insights. And, and so we're always trapped by this non-conscious nature of knowledge. And our clients need to understand this. 
Our L&D leadership needs to understand this because the processes and practices that we should be employing in learning and development should require us to work with more than one expert, more than one source. And if there's a limited number of those people, well, this is very inconvenient. This is hard to get their time and attention to participate with us. Yet, if we had a project steering team that we're doing the work for, they can break free those resources, those people that we need, so that they can work with us in an effective and efficient manner to produce learning that's going to have an impact, that's going to transfer back to the job because it was authentic and complete enough, and because it's focused on real-world performance, it should have an impact to the performance capabilities of those people once they get back to the job. Yeah, thank you for elaborating on that because it's, it seems really important and I think our listeners and viewers will appreciate yes. things, yeah. And if we could talk a bit more about instructional design, uh, I know that from you, from one of your articles and podcasts that uh, you already is that it should be specific for different job roles and situations and that there should be enough practice and feedback for the knowledge transfer to happen. But when we are limited in our resources and we want it to be specific, how do we achieve that? Um, what's your angle? Well, I, you know, so I think that the bottom line is you get what you pay for. And our clients that we're doing the work for, either they want some generic content and they're satisfied with that, even though it won't transfer to the job and it won't have an impact. If they're just checking the box because it's something they have to get done and they don't aren't serious about it, um, then otherwise, if it's high, if that's fine for low stakes performance and medium stakes performance, who cares? I mean, maybe we shouldn't be doing anything at all, but here we are doing something. But if it's high stakes performance, if it's got significant risks or rewards, then we need to help our clients understand that, you know, in order to have a positive impact to the performance, we've got to have the right content. And that content has to transfer. And if the content that we develop is generic and not specific, it I mean, there may be generic portions of it, but the practice with feedback needs to be specific. Um, otherwise, people don't build the competence and the confidence to go back to the job. And they'll just go back to the job and revert back to the way they always did it. Right? And that whole effort would have been a waste of time and money. But we, so we need, we, if the client is serious about this, it's, if it's about significant performance, high stakes performance, then we need to help them understand that they get what they pay for. And the, what they pay for is by the time and attention the, to make the. So you can take generic content and put uh, specific practice and feedback on it. So you might have one chunk of generic content on active listening, and you may have a, another module for practice with feedback if you're a salesperson, or practice and feedback if you're a purchasing agent, or practice and feedback if you are a team leader, or practice and feedback if you are a recruiter. So there's many different applications of active listening, and we need to take the priority target audiences and make sure that we give them authentic instruction on how to apply the topics, the tasks, the facts, the tools that we have to apply it in their job. Otherwise, they'll struggle with that. And if we're serious about that, if, if the consequences are serious enough, then the client should want to do that. And maybe you don't have active listening practice and exercises for every different job title in the company. This is where you need to prioritize who are the primary target audiences, who are the secondary target audiences, and who are the tertiary target audiences. So I think this is, this is quite a, a, a critical aspect of our work. Yeah, so we can reuse some of the generic content and then add some specific feedback and practice modules. Yeah, it sounds reasonable and accessible, yeah. Yeah, so I often talk about bookending generic content. We, our, our organizations have sometimes bought huge libraries of content. And it's like an educational model. There's this topic and that topic and this and tool and that tool. And But 
But if we don't help the learner understand before they take it, so I, I, I talk about this in book ending. So on the front end, we need somebody, the supervisor ideally, or a peer perhaps, that can say, guy, you're going to go take this content and this is how you use it. You use it here in your job or you use it here in your job or you use it here in your job. And so that's why you're going to go learn this. So we make sure that the learner understands why am I learning this? Now, if I've been an incumbent in the job for a while, that, that may be understandable. I may get that. But if I'm brand new, I mean, I don't understand why I'm going off to learn this or that. So then I can take the generic training and then I should come back to my organization. And if we bookended this correctly, my supervisor or a peer might have another module, a set of content that gives me authentic practice with feedback. And perhaps they monitor me while I'm trying to apply this. And they give me feedback that's corrective and reinforcing and help me hone my skills, my ability to do this and make me somewhat fluent. I may not have perfect fluency, able to do the job uh, with quality and quickly, but it starts me off because nobody expects somebody that's brand new and learned something to be as proficient as a, as a senior practitioner, but we get them started on the learning curve and on the performance curve, and we can help them apply this generic content because otherwise we send them off to the generic content. They get it. They think about how to apply it. They may not quite understand that well enough. They may try. They may struggle with that. That forces them again into trial and error learning and informal social learning, which may not be it may eventually be effective. It certainly isn't efficient. And again, if it's about high stakes performance, we should do a much better job of helping learners become performers. Yeah, it's all about priorities then and just being clear yeah, on what's important here. Yeah. And um, many of our companies, uh, our customers, they are IT companies. Some of them are enterprise companies, other startups uh, that are growing fast. And if they got convinced and they wanted to try and uh, make this shift toward uh, performance approach and learning, how do they do that? Where do, where do they start? Maybe you have some tips uh, for them. Yeah, so I think that it is about, as you just said, prioritization. So I would under, want to target not necessarily people and job titles to start with. I would I would target the processes, the business processes that are critical to the organization. And it could involve different functions. It could involve HR and recruiting people. It could involve engineering and, and design of products and services. It could be the, the people who install things. You know, so you can pick your top priority processes where maybe people are struggling or you just want to do a better job than you are right now and start there. And then once you've targeted the processes, you can target the key job titles within those processes. And then you can focus in on what are the outputs and what are the tasks and what are the gaps and, and what are the enabling knowledge and skills and begin to build or buy content that will help them help people perform in the job. So it's not about learning. It's about performance. Even in a learning organization, even in a learning culture, it's all, those are means to the ends of performance. And so, first of all, we've got to understand the performance is what we're trying to affect. And performance happens within business processes or what's sometimes called work streams or more lately is being called workflows. It's all about that work that people are trying to perform and we need to help them understand that. So we need to understand what is that work? And then we can systematically derive what do they need to know in order to be able to do? And that's where the content comes in to help people know what to do and how to do it. It sounds right to the point. I mean, yeah. So you can take a lot of steps and they all would be wrong. And um, your take on that really resonates with me, yeah. And if someone wants to learn more about human performance technology, could you suggest uh, some resources or thought leaders to follow them? 
Yeah, so I I saw that question and I thought I I can't boil it down to five people. Okay. So my professional home since 1979 is an organization called ISPI, the International Society for Performance Improvement. And I've been a, a, a longtime member. I've been on committees. I've been on the board of directors. I've served as president-elect and president. And it is my professional home. And so that's, that's the source of this thinking that other organizations have also embraced, but this is the source. This is where the people were that, that, that gave me the insights and the tools and the techniques and the thinking to approach learning from a performance orientation. Um, and more lately, I'm involved and I'm on the executive advisory committee for a group called LDA, the Learning and Development Accelerator. And it's a new organization. It's about three years old, and they hold online conferences that are both synchronous and asynchronous. And I think that's another source because they are all about evidence-based practices in learning and development. And so those are two organizations. But uh, for your audience, there are people who are no longer with us. They're deceased. There's five of them. These were the people that were the most influential to me back in 1979 and 1980. And they are Gary Rumler, Tom Gilbert, Bob Mager, Joe Harless, and Dale Brethauer. And these were some of the thought leaders at ISPI back in, they started off in 1962. These were longtime members and would present at conferences and write papers and wrote a few books. And these were very influential to me in my practice. There's people who are um, not as involved anymore, but they have written articles and books that I think are worthy for people to go look at. And those would be Richard Clark, who I already mentioned, uh, Neil Rackham, Harold Stolovich. Uh, but Today, there are people who are very, very active in this, and this is, um, I'm sorry, this is a little bit longer list, but the people that I would suggest you follow that are active still today are available to at, uh, answer your questions would be people like Ruth Clark, Will Tallheimer, Carl Binder, Steve Villachica, Don Snyder, Miriam Nealon, Patty Shank, Jane Bozarth, and Julie Dirksen. And literally, there are dozens and dozens, if not hundreds more. Clark Quinn comes to mind now that he's not on this list, and he should have been. But, but there are many, many people who you should follow who are uh, know the research or reflect the research and what the evidence is shown by research and can guide your practices uh, and inform your processes so that you will do a better job of producing learning and development content that will truly transfer back to the job and have an impact on the business metrics, because that's what it's all about. Yeah, and what about your work? Uh, where do our listeners and viewers uh, can learn more about your work and maybe find your books? Well, I so my website is uh, epic.biz, that's with two P's, E-P-P-I-C dot B-I-Z. And you can find me on Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, and I have a YouTube channel and that's Guy W. Wallace. So there's two W's uh, in the title. And so you can, you can search for me and find me and connect with me on there. And I, I do share a lot. I'm uh, just about ready to turn 70 years old. I'm in, I'm a semi-retired consultant. I do st I do do still do some projects if they're interesting, but I'm spending more of my time here trying to help others climb this learning curve with the performance orientation and to be more effective and efficient in their own practices. Um, I, I they need to think a little bit differently about their work as a learning experience designer or an instructional designer. Um, and that's what I'm trying to do with uh, the, the, my last few years. Thank you for such enlightening conversation. I enjoyed it so much. It was so great to meet you and talk to you. I, I believe that our listeners and viewers will love this conversation. 
And yeah, so thank you so much. You're very welcome.